Hi, and welcome to today's Journal Club hosted by the AST Transplant Administration and Quality Management Community of Practice. In a moment, I will turn the discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Marie Chisholm Burns, who will introduce our presenter, Dr. Kimberly Jacob Ariola. But first, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. In a moment, you will see a poll pop up on your screen. Please take a moment to answer this while we finish rem the remaining announcements. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the recording. If you have a question during the Journal Club, please use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the Journal Club. Please be aware that if you click the X icon in the upper right of the main GoToWebinar panel, you will close, close and exit the webinar. This Journal Club is being recorded and the archive will be available within a few days on the TX Admin and Quality Management COP Hub. Finally, when you log off of today's Journal Club, you will see a short survey to complete. We will use this information to help keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to Dr. Chisholm Burns to begin our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Today we have the great pleasure of having Dr. Kimberly Jacob Arella with us. Dr. Kimberly Jacob Arella is a Charles Howard Candler Professor of Behavioral, Social, and Health Education Sciences in the Rollins School of Public Health of Emory University. After graduating from Spelman in Atlanta, Georgia, she earned an MA and a PhD from Northeastern University, both in social psychology. She also earned an MPH in epidemiology from Rollins School of Public Health there at Emory. Now, for the past 20 years, her work has focused on social and behavioral factors that impact the health of African Americans. Aside from being a faculty member, she also serves as the Executive Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for the Rollins School of Public Health. Please help me in welcoming my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kimberly Jacob Arella. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Chisholm Burns. I very much appreciate that kind introduction. First, it's just a pleasure to be here today. I very much appreciate and enjoy opportunities to discuss and think more deeply about the kinds of issues that we're dealing with today. Uh oh, my slide. There we go. Um, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. I'd like to start with a story. Um, in May 1968, a black factory worker named Bruce Tucker fell off of a concrete wall at the, at the egg plant where he worked and sustained a serious head injury. He was rushed to the nearest emergency room at the Medical College of Virginia. Tucker was alone when he was admitted and after a cursory attempt to contact family members, the medical team assumed that he had no friends or family to act as a surrogate. Tucker was declared legally dead and his body unclaimed. His body maintained on mechanical ventilation was turned over to the transplant team. Less than 24 hours after the fall, surgeons had removed Tucker's heart and transplanted it into Joseph Klett's body. Now, this story is described in this 2016 paper by Koretsky in a book that was just released last month by Chip Jones. So you might ask yourself, what drove decisions surrounding this transplant and how have they changed over time? Now, certainly regulations around consent and the definition of death have been more firmly established since, since that time. But I would also argue that there were other factors at play. There was a status and prestige among transplant surgeons around who could race to deliver the most advanced medical procedures uh, quicker than others. There was also state-sanctioned violence towards Black bodies. This was 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. had just been assassinated the month before. This was following years of um, violence towards African Americans and others in the context of the civil rights movement and in the inequities and injustices that preceded the actual movement itself. 
There was also probably an underlying distrust of the health system among members of the surrounding black community around the institution where the transplant occurred. I would also argue that there were assumptions made about the value of Bruce Tucker and Joseph Klett's lives, whose life is more valuable than the others. So it's easy to look back and say that this type of egregious act was typical of the cultural, political, and scientific climate of 1968. The transplant of hearts from black to white bodies, from relatively poor men to relatively wealthy men, was simply a product of the time, right? But history is watching us too. 50 years from now, will historians look back on events of today, shaking their head at the inaction towards glaring racial disparities in access to transplant? So I'm gonna spend some time today talking about how racism is the backdrop by which our political, economic, social, and healthcare decisions are made in an effort to incite honest conversations and prudent actions to ameliorate these disparities. So let me start uh, with a quick overview of what I'll do during our time together. First, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by racism. I'll start with some key definitions. And then I'll spend just a bit of time talking about what is known about racism health and health. But the majority of the presentation will really focus on the role of racism in creating and perpetuating disparities in transplantation, as well as how we can combat racism and transplant at multiple levels of influence. So let me start with the most basic of questions, and that is what determines the health of a population? The answer to this question lies in these five highly interconnected categories. Now we know that starting at the very bottom that the role of genes and biology is much smaller than one once thought in thinking about the health of populations. Now as a country, we put substantial financial resources towards the delivery of medical care, yet this too is not the critical driver of the health of populations, not to offend anyone on this call, of course, because I'm equally critical of my own field, behavioral and social sciences. For quite some time, we placed great emphasis on changing human behavior without deeply appreciating how the social, cultural, and political environment shapes that behavior. So, so, so as an example, in the late 1990s, it was, there was clear evidence that the prevalence of HIV was increasing among women of color. And so my field, behavioral and social sciences, um, you know, busily developed and implemented interventions that taught women how to put condoms on their partners. Right. And so there were interventions that, you know, I, I kind of talk about how the, the skills that they were building were practiced on bananas. So you taught women, women how to put a condom on a banana without really appreciating the broader socio-political context that shapes whether she can influence the um, protective behavior in that particular encounter. So it's well documented that aspects of the physical environment influences our health vis-a-vis -vis the air we breathe and what food we have accessible. But it's this fifth category that I'm gonna spend the most time on today, the social determinants of health. These factors encompass economic and social conditions that influence the health of people and communities. These conditions are shaped by socioeconomic position, which is the amount of money, power, and resources that people have, all of which are influenced by these broader socioeconomic and political factors, including policies, culture, and societal values. So the Acknowledging these social factors, the World Health Organization created the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And so it just as an aside, they just define the social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. The commission created this conceptual framework based on the scientific evidence that describes relationships among individual and structural variables like governance processes, policies, culture, social norms, and values. And this framework argues that these factors form the context in which social position exists, which also informs these kinds of individual factors like individual material circumstances or, or connectedness, psychosocial factors, the health behaviors that I talked about earlier. And they all come together to ultimately determine the distribution of health and well being in a population. But as we reflect on the key drivers of socioeconomic and the political context in this particular country, we have to be explicit 
about the role of racism. It impacts governance, policy, cultural, and societal norms and values in profound ways. So let me start with a few definitions. Um, there are many definitions of race, but there's general consensus that it is a social construct, not a biological concept. This idea is firmly entrenched in the research literature and stems from the fact that there is much greater genetic heterogeneity within racial groups than between racial groups. So when I use the term race, I'm referring to a socially constructed set of categories used primarily as a basis of social inequity and social oppression. It precisely captures the impacts of racism. So what is racism? Racism is first, it's, it's an organized system. And that's the thing I would really, if you take nothing away from this presentation, those three words, it's an organized system premised on the categorization and ranking of social groups into races and does three things, devalues, disempowers, and differentially allocates desirable societal opportunities and resources to racial groups regarded as inferior. It's well understood that racism is deeply entrenched in US society and that race intersects with other identities to shape how racism is experienced. So health, health is not merely the absence of disease. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, according to the World Health Organization. Health is a human right that should be distributed according to need. And it may be undermined by discriminatory policies, pra policies practices, and processes, regardless of intent. So the American Public Health Association further expounded on this definition of racism. They argued that it serves as a driving force of the social determinants of health and as a barrier to health equity. So I've, I've talked about the importance of social determinants in driving the health of populations and the American Public Health Association is saying, and racism is a central aspect of those social determinants. They argue that it structures opportunities and assigns value based on how a person looks. It creates conditions that um, unfairly advantage some and unfairly disadvantage others. It hurts the health of our entire nation. And that's another key point. The entire country suffers because some people are prevented from attaining their highest level of health. It operates at various levels in society and it may be intentional or unintentional. So I just argue that racism is a driving force of the social determinants of health. And so this statement aligns with the assertion that racism is a fundamental cause of health inequities. In this classic 1995 paper, um, Link and Phelan argued that social factors such as socioeconomic status and social support are likely fundamental causes. So fundamental causes of disease because they determine access to important resources, they affect multiple disease outcomes through multiple mechanisms, and consequently, they maintain an association with disease even when intervening mechanisms change. So when we think about health outcomes, we tend to think of the more proximal risk factors for disease, right? So we'll think um, obesity as a risk factor for diabetes, and that makes a lot of good sense. There's all kind of data showing those linkages, right? But what are the conditions that drive the risk factors? What social conditions drive the obesity epidemic in this country? Might it be policies that incentivize the growth and distribution of some foods over others? Might it be cultural and social norms around portion size? This theory of fundamental causes argues that social conditions determine access to resources. And by resources, I'm talking about knowledge, money, power, prestige, and social connections that then determine exposure to risk. So these social conditions impact multiple risk factors and multiple disease outcomes. And so changing the health of populations requires intervening on precisely these social conditions. And racism is a key driver of these social conditions. Now, one of the challenges of understanding the role of racism in health is that as a society, we tend to be ahistorical. Right, so we'll say you can't change the past or I wasn't even alive when those bad things happen. But the reality is that history matters, particularly when its remnants are still felt today. So Byrd and Clayton provided a nice historical overview of black white health disparities by arguing that they are rooted in 246 years of chattel slavery, including a slave health deficit that was documented even back then. 100 years of legal segregation and discrimination 
and in access to inferior medical care among African Americans. And the current contemporary social, political, and economic isolation, oppression, and exploitation that results in a dual and unequal health system where many Black Americans continue to receive substandard health care. Now, we know that African Americans are more likely to lack health insurance and less likely to access needed health care. For many without the means to pay for health care, public hospitals and community clinics serve as a safety net. These authors conclude that virtually all of the data suggest that from our country's earliest beginnings, Black, poor, Native American, and immigrant populations suffered the worst health out status, outcomes, and health care. Certainly, modern U.S. healthcare has evolved, but has but has faced challenges shedding this problematic past. Now, as an FYI, I have this picture of Meharry Medical College here because discrimination against African Americans to enter medical schools and teaching hospitals in Tennessee was so extreme that in, in 1876, Black physicians opened one of the first African American medical schools, considered the first of its kind in the South, to serve the Black community. So this historical context explains the long history of racism and driving health. Race-associated differences in health outcomes seen today are a direct consequence of racism that has been rooted in, in, in an operation for 400 years. Jones theorizes three levels of racism. I'll tell you that I'm going to spend most of this presentation focusing on institutionalized and structural racism. So I'm gonna go a little bit of out of order and talk first briefly about internalized racism and then about personally mediated racism. Um, but there was, and also let me take a moment to just thank those of you who submitted questions in advance because there were some really great questions submitted about this issue of structural racism that I will get to over the course of this presentation. So first, internalized racism. This type of racism is characterized by members of the stigmatized races, races acceptance of negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth. It's characterized by their not believing in others who look like them and not believing in themselves. Now, a common cited, commonly cited paper in the transplant literature is a study conducted by Ayani and et al. in 1999, where a smaller proportion of black patients than white patients were very certain that they preferred uh, about their preference. These were among dialysis patients, were very certain about their preference for renal transplant. And so I've seen the study cited often as evidence that Black patients do not want a transplant. However, patient preferences are shaped by a historical context of systemic devaluation. In the 2017 paper I, that I uh, wrote that you all had access to prior to this presentation, I argued that this Ayanian finding may be a function of Black patients' acceptance of negative messages that they're not worthy of the most advanced treatment. Moreover, a sense of distrust of the medical establishment, which rests on a foundation of racial discrimination and a history of segregated and inferior medical care may contribute to African-American patients reporting less interest in a complex medical procedure like transplant. The findings of this study must be considered in the larger context of the structural forces that shape patient preferences. Personally mediated racism is is manifested in prejudice and racial discrimination. So racial discrimination is differential behaviors towards others based on race. Personally mediated racism manifests itself in the lack of respect, suspicion, everyday avoidance, devaluation, dehum and dehuman dehumanization. There's a large literature linking perceived discrimination to health outcomes and access to advanced medical procedures. In this paper I co-authored with Reem Hamoda, Hamoda and others, we report the findings in which we surveyed over 500 black and white ESRD patients who were referred for evaluation at one of three transplant centers in Georgia and found that uh, reports of higher perceived racism were associated with lower evaluation initiation and experiences, experiences of discrimination in healthcare settings were also associated with lower evaluation initiation. Finally, I'm going to turn to institutionalized or what more recently people call structural racism. 
Um, if anybody follows Kamar Jones' work, you'll know that in her earlier writings, she talks about institutionalized racism, but in her 2018 paper, she talks about structural racism, but it's, it's, it's really the same concept. This type of racism permeates the structure of society and it shapes the life chances of individuals in racialized ways across multiple domains, for example, political, social, and economic. In contrast to the other forms of racism that I just described, this type of racism refers to macro level systems, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. Now, the mechanisms in which societies foster racial discrimination through these systems include housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice that reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and the distribution of resources. Social segregation is a common form of structural racism that's discussed in the scientific literature. And I have this picture, just as an FYI, of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, as it is the most segregated metro area in the country. An estimated 54% of the Black population of Pine Bluff lives in predominantly Black neighborhoods, which is more than three times the 17% national figure. So what does segregation have to do with transplant? Studies generally find that dialysis facilities located in neighborhoods with a greater proportion of black residents have lower transplant rates, worse indicators of quality and higher mortality rates, although results are somewhat inconsistent. St segregation in part is driven by financial resources. And this graph on the right documents racial disparities, disparities in median earnings among black and white workers by gender. So you can see that white males annual median earning, earnings um, are, were shown to be around $60,000 a year compared to 46,000 um, for white women, 42,000 for black men and 37,000 for black women. And let me just say a quick word about socioeconomic status. Structural racism is what explains why socioeconomic status and race are so closely linked in this country. Socioeconomic status shapes people's experiences of racism. It's become normative to align socioecon low socioeconomic status with blackness, but it's important to remember that socioeconomic status does not fully explain racial disparities in access to transplant based on available data. Now, I now turn to this question of what is known about racism in health. But to fully understand this question, we have to acknowledge the mechanisms or the processes of racism. It operates in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, all of which offer different elements of decision making. Now, I've heard people ask, well, policies and laws that explicitly support racism, like Jim Crow laws or legalized segregation, they've ended. So why do the remnants of these policies remain? I would argue that it's because racism remains rooted in our structures, practices, norms, and values. So we have to be intentional about not only changing policies, but also dismantling the structures, reevaluating our practices, and questioning our values if we are to make progress towards eliminating the health effects of racism. So what do we know about the effects of, re of racism on health? We, there's very well documented racial disparities in health across a range of different outcomes. Um, and so we've moved as a field past this documentation of racial disparities. They're there. We can, we can move on to thinking about intervention safely. Um, and I would argue that another advancement in the field is that there's an increasing emphasis on the social determinants of health. I, I, I believe that in medicine, you know, there's a lot greater discussion of social determinants of health today, whereas 10 years ago, there was probably very little discussion of social determinants. And so th there's areas in which there's growth um, that's really moving us in a good direction. I would say as a field, we're moving to understanding social factors in deep ways and moving strictly beyond just saying it's, it's class, you know, it's just socioeconomic status or it's just behavior to looking at these broader social factors. And I would also argue that there's a, a decreasing reluctance to identify racism as a root cause. The fact that um, I was invited to come give this talk today is evidence of that decreasing reluctance. But this area of research still faces challenges, such as the focus on the individual. Um, interpersonal racial discrimination is really where much of this literature lies. So 
studies looking at people's personal experiences of racial discrimination as they relate to health outcomes. Moreover, our interventions are largely at the individual level. I think that instead of focusing solely on individual level factors, we really need studies and interventions at multiple levels. And, I, and, and so I would say that measures around individual experiences of racial discrimination are far more sophisticated and we're far further along in our thinking about measures than thinking about measures at the structural level. And so as a field, we have to continue to think about measuring racial res, racism at structural levels to more fully understand how it impacts health. But at the end of the day, it's macro level interventions that will have the greatest impact. So Bailey et al. Um, in their 2017 paper suggests these nine pathways in which racism impacts health. And I loosely categorize these, categorize these pathways as existing at the macro, meso, and micro levels. So you can see these nine pathways here. I'm gonna come back to those pathways and as we think about how racism impacts transplant. And I'm gonna to turn to this question of racism and transplant by starting with what we know based on the literature. We know that black patients are less likely to be referred for transplant evaluation, to initiate the transplant evaluation process, to complete the evaluation process, to be placed on the waiting list, to undergo live donor transplant or any type of transplant, including preemptive transplant. And with this crowd, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about racial disparities in access to transplant. Um, I feel like this group is, is well aware of these disparities and lives these disparities. Um, but I will say a lot of this, uh, these, these next few slides are gonna focus on kidney transplant in particular because of the profound racial disparities in this area. But what you can see based on this USRDS data that African-American um, prevalent ESRD patients um, there were 21% 21, 21 of them underwent transplant in 2017 compared to 34% among white patients. I also um, have this slide that presents unadjusted kidney transplant rates from 2014 to 2017. And I restricted it to these dates because 2014 is when the new kidney allocation system um, was implemented. And what you can see here is that um, there was a, somewhat of an increase in transplant rates among African-American patients that since that's pretty much plateaued, that really what you can see is the largest increase um, in um, kidney transplant rates among Asian patients. So no real you know, impact that we can see, substantial impact um, on racial disparities um, for African-American patients. So, what is the role of structural racism in creating and perpetuating racial disparities in transplant? Um, we know that racial disparities in transplant are compelling and persistent. We know that race is a proxy for the experience of racism, but how exactly does racism operate in the field of transplantation? I would argue that among these nine pathways that were hypothesized by Bailey et al., there are four that are particularly relevant to our field of transplant. Um, and so I'm gonna pause and say that um, there really was a great question that was submitted in advance of this talk asking what I meant by system level factors that produce racial disparities and access to transplant. And when I talk about system level factors, I'm talking about these macro and meso level factors. Um, that I'm gonna spend more of the presentation kind of focusing on. So when you think about these four particular pathways um, in relationship to transplant, the linkages become more clear, right? So what does it take to get a transplant? Um, I would argue that economic injustice, social deprivation and inadequate healthcare can certainly undermine aspects of the medical suitability that must be demonstrated the ability to demonstrate adequate financial resources, including health insurance and the ability to pay for immunosuppressant medications um, throughout one's lifetime, and access to quality education about this treatment option. At the micro level, um, the psychological trauma and stereotype threat that I referred to in the previous slide, they can certainly undermine one's level of support to pursue this treatment option, as well as and in, as well as individual patient advocacy to pursue this treatment option. So hopefully it's becoming more evident how these macro level factors like finances and education ultimately influence the micro level factors like patient advocacy. So 
If we're serious about addressing racism and transplant, we have to start with acknowledgement that it operates through structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. So I argued earlier that changing policies alone won't fix the problem um, without attention to these other mechanisms. So I just created a few examples of structures, policies, practices, and norms that, that are, are worthy of attention and relevant to this issue. Um, as we think of structures, we might think of um, how primary care, about the need for linkages between primary care to nephrology care and CKD care to dialysis facilities and dialysis facilities to transplant. And AST in particular has supported a policy initiative that strengthens ties among broad community, among a broad community of relevant stakeholders, including transplant centers, dialysis facilities, OPOs community hospitals. And this is out of understanding that black patients are probably falling through the cracks at each of those transitions in care policies. We know that African-American patients undergo live donor kidney transplant at lower rates than white patients due to a myriad of factors, but financial incentives like reimbursement for medical costs and paid leave for live donor kidney transplant could alleviate some of these barriers. And there's some studies that are evaluating um, some interventions to do just this. Practices, to what extent are there evidence-based practices and care processes in place across systems that accommodate the unique needs of vulnerable patients? Or have we just accepted that, for example, lower referral rates among dialysis facilities in black and brown communities are just how it is? And then finally, in terms of values, do we accept racial disparities in access to transplant as the norm? Or do we fight against these disparities with all that we've got? So as a behavioral scientist, it's hard for me to think, it's, it's probably a sickness, but it's hard for me to think outside of the confines of some sort of theoretical or conceptual framework. And so I kind of dumped all of my ideas into this um, framework for thinking about structural racism and transplant. And this framework that I'm about to present to you um, rests on these four tenets. One is that structural racism is foundational to the other forms of racism. I argued that earlier. Addressing structural racism requires acknowledgement of the historical injustices that I presented and a desire to alter the consequences of these injustices. Three, addressing structural racism is the work of all of us. And so we all have to think about how structural racism is operating in our own spheres of influence. And then finally, data documenting racial disparities may or may not be available. It might be that the evidence is flawed. And I say evidence in, in air quotes, it might be that there were certain groups that were excluded from relevant studies and or certain groups that were overrepresented in certain studies. And structural racism might still be operating. So for example, there was a point in time where there was no clear evidence that African-Americans underwent live donor kidney transplant at lower rates of white Americans. Just because that evidence didn't exist at the time didn't mean that that disparity didn't exist. It just meant that the evidence didn't exist. So in what other areas might there be disparities for which there perhaps are just not data? So this framework, um, <laughs> so this framework builds on the four pathways that I argued are most relevant from the Bailey et al. model, economic injustice, inadequate healthcare, psychological trauma, and stereotype threats. So in, in thinking about those four pathways in the context of transplant, it's clear to see how economic injustice fuels limited financial resources, which are so critically important and foundational to being able to undergo a transplant in this country. It ought to be easy to see how inadequate health care really fuels inequities along the entire CKD continuum. We know that there's evidence that African-Americans present um, at later stage kidney disease than white Americans. We know that African-Americans are less likely to undergo preemptive transplant or to be educated about transplant as a tre treatment option at those later stages of CKD. It's might, it might be easy to think about psychological trauma and how experiences of racial discrimination both within and outside of the healthcare system um, fuel limited support. Patients have to be able to demonstrate familial support in order to undergo transplant. And then in the best trans, in, in ideal situations, they also have professional support from social workers and transplant systems and transplant centers as well. But in what ways, are those supports impacted by the psychological trauma of racial discrimination? And then finally, the stereotype threat might fuel feeling unworthy of a transplant. 
And I think that these four factors come together to generate poor outcomes um, or disparities in outcomes related to referral for evaluation, approval for waitlist, and actual transplant that we see in the data. So let me just talk a little bit about those four pathways. I'm going to focus on the transplant specific side, um, which is the right panel that you're looking at. So what are things that the, tra the you know, there's the, the broader context includes things that our society certainly needs to work on, the differential access to life opportunities um, that both were codified in law and then those that occur after, after those laws have been um, uh, dismantled strictly because um, they just remain, they've just remained um, in place. Um, the pay gap I presented earlier. But the reality is that there's transplant specific efforts that are needed and interventions that are needed around Medicare coverage gaps that could help alleviate some of these economic injustices. There's this issue of immunosuppressive medication only being covered for the first three years post-transplant and many people on this call, um, including um, those at AST have engaged in an enormous amount of advocacy around this work to make to change this. Um, and then transplant centers, play a particular role in this process and ought to be asking questions like, what aspects of the evaluation process create economic barriers that drive disparities in access to transplant? These are the questions that transplant center administrators ought to be asking the, their staff and ought to be uh, determining the answers to within, within their own centers based on their own data. In terms of inadequate healthcare, um, you know, one of the key goals ought to be to slow the progression to ESRD among black patients. We know that black patients progress to ESRD at rates three or four, three to four times that of white patients. But with that understanding, um, to what extent could we draw from patient navigation models or community health workers to um, help manage and, and slow this progression? Um, at the same time, reimbursement for the work of community health workers is lacking. And so trying to find funding for this kind of work remains difficult. Um, we want, as a field, we should be thinking about strengthening linkages between primary care and specialty care to, to tighten up those processes, those gaps um, in healthcare. The kidney allocation system is a critically important lever that ought to be explored for the explicit purpose of addressing racial disparities in, in transplant access. Um, disparities in referral and transplantation um, could be disincentivized, particularly think about the dialysis facilities. If there were data systems that monitored um, disparities in referral or disparities in transplant for transplant centers, and there were um, disincentives for those disparities at the federal level. And again, within transplant centers, the question is how can supports be erected to enhance medical suitability? How can transplant centers um, work to help ensure that financial issues and social support and other questions that somehow that sometimes disadvantage um, or other issues that sometimes disadvantage black patients, how can those be addressed? And there was a really great question that came in um, prior to this presentation that asked this very question of, of how to raise more finance, raise attention to this issue that African Americans sometimes seem to be uh, seem to be um, require a, a higher bar in terms of their ability to uh, demonstrate financial resources and social support in their ability to being waitlisted for transplant. So there has to be evaluation data um, at, at multiple levels that really address the ways in which transplant centers and dialysis facilities operate and in an effort to tighten up those systems and reduce disparities. In terms of psychological trauma, from a transplant center perspective, um, I think that social workers really are the critical, are, are critical piece here. We have to think about to what extent are caseloads for transplant social workers too high? To what extent do transplant social workers have the resources that they need to do their work effectively? They play a critical role in delivering the necessary professional support and garnering familial support, social, you know, other types of social support for patients who are considering transplant. I think that at the end of the day, what's critical here is trust. Um, the African, you know, this idea of distrust of the healthcare establishment is very well earned, and so we have to think about how to how do we work systematically 
to strengthen trust in our systems, trust in our providers, because that 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 uh, this uh, distrust is really at the core of some of the challenges that we face. So transplant centers could ask themselves, how can culturally sensitive supports mitigate, mitigate against a checkered past within healthcare systems? And then lastly, in terms of stereotype threats, um, most of us are aware that um, Medicare improvements for patients and providers act, the Medicare improvements for patient and providers act of 2008 mandates that patients with advanced kidney dysfunction receive education about all ESRD treatment options tailored to the specific needs of populations. But to what extent is culturally sensitive education and decision support tools, to what extent are these really being used? We have to understand that knowledge is necessary, but not sufficient for behavior change. So it's not enough to just give a person a pamphlet um, without appreciating the larger socio-political, economic, um, and cultural context in which that information is being shared. We have to dig deeper to understand patient preferences. So what role do we all play? Um, the literature around structural racism might lead um, le readers to believe that it's these structures that need fixing, a these structures. So these structures need to be addressed by policymakers and lawmakers and governments. But I want to really reframe the narrative today. I want to reframe the narrative to one that empowers all of us to change these structures. We all have a role to play in combating structural racism. It's typically thought of as operating within and between societal institutions, like, like between the healthcare system and the education system or something like that. But that definition misses the lower level structures that we might actually have influence on. So I believe that there's multiple levels of structures in which racism operates in transplant and is amenable to intervention. So of course, at the societal level, we need, you know, health care for all. We need health and access to health insurance. Education, empl employment, and income disparities need to be addressed. Um, but there are things that professional and practice organizations should be doing, transplant centers, and individual actors. We have to think about organizational policies, practices, and processes within our own workplaces. And so um, the final portion of my, my presentation answers this question of how we can combat racism and transplant at multiple levels of influence. It requires that we take an anti-racism lens and asking, how is racism operating here? So Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is a New York Times bestseller. And in this book, he argues that all policies are either racist or anti-racist. There's nothing in between. Policy, from his standpoint, refers to written and unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, and regulations, and guidelines that govern people. So Kendi argues that there is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Every policy is one or the other. So Another question, I'll just tell you another great question that was submitted in advance is that given recent events um, and the many statements coming from medical societies and institutions to fight racism and health disparities and all the conversations we're having, how can we move beyond the statements at all levels, including individual and institutional levels? And that was just a great question. That's what I'm gonna you know, close this presentation answering. So there's much that can be done at the society level and within dialysis and transplant centers, but given the audience of today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on professional organizations like AST um, and individual people like you and me. Um, so you know, one of the things that professional organizations have to do is to prioritize efforts to eliminate racial disparities in access to transplant. And so this is um, not only addressing structural racism within your own organization, it's also working to address the ways in which structural racism impacts disparities in access to transplant. Um, in a, a 2016 paper, Hardiman et al. argued for the establishment of a professional standard that it focused on this issue very explicitly, um, a, a professional medical com competency on mastering the health effects of structural racism. Um, professional organizations could do work around building the research base in needed areas such as the social determinants of health, racism in particular, dedicating a journal issue to this issue, um, to this work would help build the, the research base on this, help diversify the workforce, but it's not just about diversity, it's about inclusion and equity. Um, 
And I'm really pleased to be uh, invited to join this ideal task force that really is going to focus on structural racism um, with an AST. And Dr. Chisholm Burns co-chairs this um, task force along with Dr. Caicedo. And um, I'm really excited about the work of this task force and because there, there seems to be a really genuine desire to really put into action um, some, some work that needs to be done around structural racism. Individual actors. Um, first, let me start with, let me go back to APHA's definition of racism. It stated that racism creates conditions that unfairly advantage some and unfairly disadvantage others. So we have to acknowledge privilege. Now, I'm a cisgendered, middle-class, able-bodied Christian woman, um, and there are privileges that I enjoy that I don't even see, right? It's just in the air. Um, I'll just say real quickly once more, we had gone out to dinner as a family and my daughter made the comment that the service was so great at this really nice restaurant. And I it, I, I was struck that I, I needed to tell her that the, re the service was great because we can't afford to eat there. So that's class privilege, right? We can afford to eat there. And so people treat us great and we just think everybody is treated great, um, but it's not everybody. It's those who can afford to eat there. Um, and so there's many types of privilege. And so um, it's my responsibility to use my privilege to right the wrongs that occur in society. So there's a lot of attention on this issue of white privilege in particular because of its role in sustaining racial disparities in health, which are so profound. We need to educate healthcare professionals around anti-racism, emphasize structures versus bad apples. Um, in the Hardman paper 2016, they made a nice um, argument there. There are very few physicians that come to work every day and seek to discriminate against black patients. But these same physicians exist in larger social structures and, and structures within the healthcare system that perpetuate and sustain racial disparities in health. And so let's work on the structures and not focus so much on the bad apples, the structures will work on the bad apples. Let's so we can examine our own processes and practices and the ways in which they support structural racism and be willing to make mistakes. In the Hardeman et al. paper, they make very specific recommendations for clinicians, um, including understanding, I encourage you to read this paper, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, understanding the role of racism in driving contemporary health disparities. Um, there's been a lot of research that examines race, but much less research that examines racism. So let's shift our clinical and research focus, um, as these are all just a list of key ways that could help move the needle on this issue of structural racism. I'm going to end by coming back to the story. So less than 24 hours after his admission to the Medical College of Virginia Emergency Department, again, Tucker's heart had been removed and placed in the body of a white man, Joseph Klett, who subsequently died less than a week later. Bruce Tucker's family, which had not been informed of the hospitalization, let alone told about the plans to use him as a donor, opened a wrongful death lawsuit against the hospital, which dragged on for years before it was finally settled by an all white jury in favor of Medical College of Virginia. That's structural racism, by the way. Um, but because of the pervasiveness of racism, no one was surprised that this story involved taking an organ from a black man and placing it into the body of a white man. Like that would be assumed because that's just the air that we breathe, right? But with enough will, these kinds of stories can be replaced with stories of black patients getting transplanted at the same rates as white patients. So I'm gonna conclude um, by arguing that the United States is a race conscious society with racism embedded in its social fabric. Naming it and actively working against racism, it's the work of all of us. The Transplant Center, because of the pervasive and compelling racial disparities and access, have an important role to play. And we might be at a moment in history to change the course of these inequities. If anybody listening has watched um, Hamilton as many times as I have over the summer, um, because my actual um, showing was canceled, um, you'll be familiar with this phrase that history is watching us. I'm going to close with this quote. Structural racism is causing widespread suffering not only for black people and other communities of color, but for our society as a whole. It is a threat to the physical, emotional, and social well-being of every person in the society that allocates privilege on the basis of race. And I thank you for your attention. So this is Marie Chisholm Burns and Dr. Kimberly Jake Warella. I wanna thank you for an outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. And so I'm going to start the questions. 
I would like for you to speak to us a little bit of how colorblindness uh, and the term colorblindness, what that is, because maybe everyone is not familiar with it, and how that plays in, because sometimes you, people might not see it. They think they have all great intentions and they just don't see it. Thanks so much for that great question, Dr. Shizem Burns. It's, 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 it's a very timely question. Um, there are some that would argue that they don't see race that they are colorblind, they treat everyone the same. Um, I would argue that that's, um, it's actually impossible to treat everyone the same. I, I mean, I'll be the first to admit, I don't treat everyone the same. Um, and so it's actually impossible. Um, and the problem with colorblindness is that it assumes that you can choose not to see color. But it's like, if you're, if you're breathing the air, you see color <laughs> because that's the country we live in. Um, we live in a race conscious society. And what's most concerning about color blindness, there's two things that are actually this idea of not seeing color and treating everybody the same um, in theory is that it emphasizes the individual agency and the meritocracy um, and assumes that everyone is at their station in life based on their own individual merits. And that's simply not true. Um, we all enjoy some amount of advantage and disadvantage based on a range of different characteristics. Um, the, the second thing that concerns me about this, uh, this way of thinking is that it, it is inherently ahistorical. I argued that if we don't consider the past, we will never make progress to, uh, towards addressing health inequities. So colorblindness inherently ignores the past, and that's what prevents us from being able to make meaningful um, headway on this issue of health inequities. Thank you very much. Another question uh, came in, and uh, the question has to do with you uh, further explaining structural violence. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, and so, so again, I'm a social psychologist, but Paul Farmer is a, is a great scholar in this area. I believe he's an anthropologist, he might be a demographer, but um, he wrote a paper in um, 20... 2006 on structural violence and clinical medicine. And it's structural violence is really a, a term that was uh, coined many, many years ago that describes how social structures, and by structures, again, they're talking about the economic, political, legal, religious, and cultural factors. They stop individuals, groups, and societies from reaching their full potential. And the word violence is used because this um, basically causes injury to people, right? This, this, in a, this pro pro prohibiting individuals from reaching their full potential is, is likened to injury. And so the field of medical anthropology has done a lot of work around this issue of structural violence. Um, and so people use that term to, to, to describe the ways in which societal structures bear down on people in violent ways that inhibit health. And so, you know, what we've seen in video with George Floyd's death and other forms and other um, egregious acts of race, structural racism over the summer um, are indicative of structural violence in profound ways. But so too is the experience of poverty for African Americans. It's still violence. It's not the type of violence we typically think about or talk about, but food insecurity is structural violence. And the, the fact that it um, disproportionately impacts African Americans is a function of racism. Um, so I just encourage uh, the person who asked this really great question to um, get this 2006 paper by Paul Farmer et al. on structural violence and clinical medicine. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm gonna ask a question because you did bring it up and I think the eyes are on this right now. I've never seen so many uh, organizations, so many, um, uh, institutions come out with statements uh, concerning what, how they feel about racism. And it was really triggered by the George Floyd, the, the law enforcement things that we can no longer deny, basically because I have my camera with me every time I, I go someplace because it's connected to my cell phone, which, which is with me at all times. But the question has to do with, from one of the audience members, is how can we go beyond, um, and I guess this was looking at individuals as well as institutional levels, beyond just making, using the words, the, the statements, because um, this might be something that's really uh, kind of addressing the times, it might fade out. Um, mm -hmm. how, would it, how do we make this more sustainable? No, that's a great question. And that's exactly the question that um, 
we're all watching the answer for right now. I mean, I'm on, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm under, I'm being watched on this question as well. Our students at Rollins um, issued a list of demands um, and they've said, we're tired of talk. We want to see actions at the Rollins School of Public Health. And um, so, you know, I too am being held accountable to needing to make change. And, you know, I, I'll say that the, I agree totally that the statements and the talk are a great starting point, but they can't be it. If that's where, if that's where this stops then we've made no progress. And so we have to continue to keep the pressure on. And I've actually been really excited to see that the pressure has actually been maintained so far. I mean, oftentimes things die out pretty quickly, but this doesn't seem, this seems to have really gathered some um, political traction. We have to keep the pressure on institutions and, and keep in mind that institutions are made up of individual people, right? So the reality is that there's a lot we can do to first educate ourselves. And so there's a lot of reading that needs to happen. And there's great books. I mean, there's no shortage of you know books on these issues of race and racism. I, I encourage uh, Kendi's book. I encourage White Fragility. I mean, there's just a long list. So let's read and get educated. And then let's own privilege and let's be willing to talk about it and let's use privilege um, to actually spur action. And then let's think about how we as individual actors can make changes in our own spheres of influence. And so, you know, I don't think we can just kind of sit back and say, okay, I'm going to sit back and see what happened. What does AST do? Or what is, what does society do? What does my school do? I would say, what are you doing? Because if we all do something, then we'll actually make progress. So, so I'm the academic dean in my school. And so I've got specific areas that I need to make progress if I'm going to be serious and intentional about dealing with, and it's not, for us, it's not just the black student demands because there's things that we need to do as a school that the students may not even know about, right? So what are the things that I need to do to address structural racism in my school? Um, and I'm committed to that. And so we have to keep the pressure on administrators to remain committed to addressing structural racism. This is not about getting some quick training on cultural sensitivity. We have to be intentional. And then think about how we can advance and expand this thinking about structural racism to broader forms of structural oppression. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I, I got you. What, what I hear from that answer is all of us individually and collectively using our privilege to make sure that this uh, stays at, at the center of our minds all the time. And so I think that, that is certainly a walk away uh, point. Uh, another question, because I think we have time for another question. In your opinion, what one action or step would you recommend to transplant programs to initiate process changes that could combat race or racism or access to renal transplantation? Yeah, that, that was another really, really great question. Um, so I feel like transplant administrators could you know start with the there was a couple of questions that I put in my slides where I think you know transplant administrators need to look at their data and, and really reckon with their data. I think that we have come to accept racial disparities, um, and so let's first agree that they're not okay, right? Um, and then look at your data and look at the steps at which African American patients drop out. And then I would encourage transplant administrators to have honest conversations with their staff and patients. So this is where um, in some papers, people talk about the importance of a kind of a patient advisory board. Um, but listening to patients to hear what their experiences were at every step of the process as a way to devise interventions to mitigate against that dropout. So if it's clear that African-American patients um, do not complete the evaluation process within your specific transplant center, so this is not national data, state data, this is your own center's data, you can have honest conversations with your staff who know, like they know, the healthcare providers, the social workers, with feedback from these range of different providers, um, nephrologists, the range of different providers who are boots on the ground working with patients and, are, and know what's happening, um, and then talking to actual patients to understand what caused that dropout. And then let's devise some interventions to deal with those, um, deal with that dropout. And then let's monitor the data to determine whether the reduction in disparities has occurred. So I feel like we have to get real micro with this. And that's why I kind of made the argument earlier that I get a little frustrated that the literature on structural racism makes it seem like it's this big thing that somebody else needs to deal with. Like, oh yeah, segregation, that's big, that's not me. Like fix that, right? Um, but no, there are structures within our own 
workplaces with our own processes that we need to understand where the disparities exist and then intervene on those disparities. Thank you. It's, as I listen to you, it makes me really uh, appreciate how everything is interconnected. Uh, your privilege is interconnected, whatever that privilege might be. Um, how how using uh, different policies and looking at them critically and not accepting uh, what what you see, um, as well as uh, looking at things uh, with your blinders off and somebody unblinding it. Because uh, again, I think that color blindness, uh, even though it's it's not acceptable. It's a real. It's some people's uh, re reality. So mm -hmm. I, I want to um, thank you for the excellent presentation that you provided for us. I'm going to turn it back over to the coordinators of, of the program. But we really do appreciate all your work. Um, keep up the great work, and, and thanks for being here today. Thank you so much for the invitation. This really was fun. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. On behalf of at the AST Transplant Administration and Quality Management COP. I just want to thank Dr. Marie Chisholm Burns for moderating this session and Dr. Kimberly Jacobs Ariola for a fantastic presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey. The recording of the session will be posted to the Transplant Administration Quality Management Hub and the AST website. Thank you again.